Hello and welcome. This is our Iceland holiday film. Our holiday was from Tuesday the 24th of May to Saturday the 4th of June 2011. Jason arrived in Orpington from Paul in the early afternoon on the 23rd ready for a holiday the next day. Tuesday the 24th of May. This should have been the day we set off on holiday. But a volcano in Iceland called Grimsfotten had started erupting three days earlier and was disrupting flights in northwestern Europe. We drove to Gatwick Airport for what should have been a delayed flight about 6.30 p.m. but the departure time kept being put back. The plane arrived from Reykjavik but stayed on the tarmac while the passengers and pilot waited for some information. Eventually we were told to go home for the night and to arrive the next day at about 5 a.m. for a 6.30 a.m. departure. The airline phoned us on the way home from Gatwick to confirm that the next flight would be 6.30 a.m. But then they texted us while we were asleep to tell us it would be 10.30 a.m. We didn't realize this until we got to the airport the next morning. Wednesday the 25th of May. After getting up at 3 a.m. we arrived at Gatwick to learn a flight had been altered to 10.30 a.m. We were given vouchers for breakfast so went to eat at Frankie in Venice. The vouchers were out of date because they were issued the previous evening, so had to be changed. The flight eventually took off about 11.30 a.m. The plane had been hired in and had no food or duty-free supplies. We arrived safely at Keflavik Airport and met the man from the car hire company. We hired a Hyundai Tucson four-wheel drive and drove from Keflavik to the Blue Lagoon Hotel Clinic. There was some difficulty finding the hotel as it wasn't signposted very well. There were very comfortable rooms with interesting views of the lava fields. We all had a rest to recover. Diane and John went to the Blue Lagoon and enjoyed bathing. Jason was very tired but came to watch. We had a very good evening meal at the Blue Lagoon restaurant. It was John's birthday, then an early night. Jason managed to stay up and see the 11.30 p.m. sunset. Thursday the 26th of May. Diane and John went for a pre-breakfast bath in the clinic's pool. They were the only people in the water. After breakfast we drove to look at the nearby settlement of Grindavik, then set off for the drive north. We got lost in Reykjavik, missed the turning and drove past the harbour to Grata Island Lighthouse, which sits at the westernmost end of Reykjavik City. We then retraced our tracks and found the right route, with some help from the satellite navigation, who I called Björk. We hadn't been expecting a sat knife because we weren't charged for it. There were no instructions. We couldn't always program it properly. And it needed its software updating. We stopped to look at the roadside information point, and the wind blew all our important holiday papers down the road, so Jason and John had to chase after them. Drove north through a tunnel under the Whale Fjord, Havel, Jotha. The tunnel is about six miles long. We came across a monument to the poet Stefan G. Stevenson who was born in Skagaf, Jotha and emigrated to America in 1873. The monument is at Vattenskart Mountain Pass near Barmahol in northern Iceland. We continued on our journey, through Akare and arrived at Hotel Cell, in the Vatten at about 8 p.m. We enjoyed a very good buffet-style meal. The rooms were small but comfortable and furnished in a traditional style. There were very small bathrooms. There was a residence lounge with a computer and Wi-Fi internet access in the rooms. Friday the 27th of May. We set off after a very good buffet breakfast to walk across the road to the nearby pseudo craters in Lake Mavatan. A pseudo crater is a volcanic landform. Pseudo craters are formed by steam explosions as flowing hot lava crosses over a wet surface, such as a swamp, a lake, or a pond. The explosive gases break through the lava's surface and the tephra builds up crater like forms which can appear very similar to real volcanic craters. The lake was created by a large lava eruption 2,300 years ago, 
and the surrounding landscape is dominated by volcanic landforms, including lava pillars and pseudo-craters. The lake and its surrounding wetlands have an exceptionally rich fauna of water birds, especially ducks. The name Evadon is sometimes used not only for the lake but the whole surrounding inhabited area. Since the year 2000, a marathon around the lake takes place in the summer. There were interesting lava formations in Lake Mivatan en route as we drove to a place called Dimavorja. When we arrived we had refreshments in a pleasant cafe as it was raining heavily. Then we walked around the lava formations. Dimavorja is a large area of unusually shaped lava fields east of Mivatan, Dima, meaning dark, Vorja, meaning cities, or forts, or castles. The Dimavorja area is composed of various volcanic caves and rock formations, reminiscent of an ancient collapsed citadel, hence the name. The dramatic structures are one of Iceland's most popular natural tourist attractions. Lunch was at Reykjavik, the Gami Berin Cafe. We had Arctic char and local fish stew. It was a very enjoyable place to eat. In the afternoon, we went to Namafjol Hivaroa to see some mud parts and fumaroles. When you get out of the car this is what you experience. You almost feel like you're on another planet. Namafjol Hivaroa is located near Lake Mabatan but in a very barren area with a moonscape appearance. There are several viewpoints on wooden platforms. This thermal area features mud pots, mud pools and fumaroles. A mud pot or mud pool is a sort of acidic hot spring. It usually takes the form of a pool of bubbling mud. The acid and microorganisms decompose the surrounding rock into clay and mud. The mud of a mud pot is generally of white to grayish color, but is sometimes stained with reddish or pink spots from iron conforms. The thickness of the mud usually changes along with seasonal changes in the water table. Here are some fumaroles. A fumarole is an opening in the Earth's crust, often near volcanoes. It emits steam and gases such as sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. The rotten egg smell can be strong depending on where you stand. A fumarole field is an area of thermal springs and gas vents. Fumaroles may persist for decades or centuries if located above a persistent heat source or they may disappear within weeks to months if they occur on top of a fresh volcanic deposit that quickly cools. Fumaroles emitting sulfurous vapors form surface deposits of sulfur-rich minerals.
just to see this hot spot in the earth bubbling away was truly fascinating. It was still raining. Back to the hotel for dinner and a very good a la carte meal. Saturday the 28th of May. We revisited Namath Jewel Havera for some more photos and video for Jason. We then continued on the way to Datifos. The Icelandic word for waterfall is Foss. Datifos is the name of the waterfall we went to see. We drove by a newly opened road. This new road was still quite rough and went through a dramatic desolate landscape. We arrived at a car park after 22 kilometers but couldn't find the access route to the Tiffles, the waterfall, because it was covered in snow. We drove back to the main road another 22 kilometers and then around to the other side of the waterfall. Again the route was covered in snow. When we arrived at the Tiffles, Diane gave up trying to get to the waterfall after a while because the snow was too deep. Jason went up to his thighs in snow at one point. There was no way for Jason to get a good spot to film a waterfall without getting his shoes soaking wet. Jason and John eventually managed to reach the waterfall. Ditchifles is 45 meters high, 100 meters across. On the way back we ray visited the Gamli Baron Cafe for a drink and a piece of cake. Dinner was at the hotel in the evening. We would give the hotel cell restaurant a higher rating. There was a very good buffet selection and an excellent chicken dish on the main menu. Sunday the 29th of May. We left Hotel Cell and set off for the journey south, across the northern mountains. The journey became quite dramatic in places as snow started to fall. We didn't see another car for many miles at a time. We continued driving. The main route deteriorated and was quite rough in places but interesting scenery, moors, waterfalls and rivers etc. Arrived at Joe Carl Salon just after 3 p.m. and had a wonderful boat trip through the ice flows. Joe Carl Salon literally means Glacial River Lagoon. It's a large glacial lake in southeast Iceland, on the edge of Vatna Joe Carl National Park, situated at the head of the Breithamaka Joe Carl Glacier. It developed into a lake after the glacier started receding from the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. The lake has grown since then at varying rates because of melting of the glaciers. It is now one and a half kilometers away from the ocean's edge and covers an area of about 18 square kilometers. It recently became the deepest lake in Iceland, at over 248 meters, as glacial retreat extended its boundaries. The size of the lake has increased fourfold since the 70s. It is considered as one of the natural wonders of Iceland. The lake can be seen from Highway 1 between Hoven and Skaftafell. It appears as a ghostly procession of luminous blue icebergs. Joe Carl Salon has been a setting for four Hollywood movies. A View to a Kill, Die Another Day, Lara Croft. Tomb Raider and Batman Begins, as well as the reality TV series Amazing Race.
Jason did lots of filming and was a bit bad with the girls in the cafe shop. They enjoyed watching his flapping shoelaces. After the boat trip we drove on to reach Hotel Hof Dabraka in time for an evening meal, buffet style again. Rooms were comfortable and good size with lovely soft towels. Monday the 30th of May We had very heavy rain beating on the roof in the night. Jason had a problem sleeping with textured cotton duvet covers. No alternatives were available although the chambermaid did try to find him something. In the morning we drove to the newly opened visitor center for the Ajaf Jalajokal Volcano Exhibition. There was a very good film and information boards. On the way back to the hotel we stopped at Skogafels and took some photos. Skogafels is situated on the Skogar River in the south of Iceland at the cliffs of the former coastline. Skogafers is one of the biggest waterfalls in the country with a width of 25 meters and a drop of 60 meters. Jason climbed to the top of the waterfall to film. We couldn't find anywhere open for lunch so bought some sandwiches at a local service station. Diane and John dropped Jason back at the hotel for the afternoon. They went to see Rennes Drang a basalt sea stacks situated near the village of Vic. The sea stacks are framed by a black sand beach that was ranked in 1991 as one of the 10 most beautiful non-tropical beaches in the world. Legend sees that the stacks originated when two trolls dragged a three-masted ship to land unsuccessfully and when daylight broke they became needles of rock. We all met up in the evening for a meal at Hotel Landy in Vic. Good local specialities. Tuesday the 31st of May. We got up early for a trip to Hainani which is part of the Westman Islands. Drove to Baiki for the ferry crossing. Hainani, literally home island is the only populated island of the Westman Islands and is home to around 4,500 people and 8 million puffins every summer. Many millions of other birds migrate there for breeding and feeding. At 13.4 square kilometers, it is the largest island in the Westman archipelago and the largest and most populated island off the Icelandic coast. Most people on the island live off fishing. During an annual festival, People are allowed to catch a few puffins to share at the festival, or to eat at home. On the island we went to the tourist office for some information about the excavation called Pompeii of the North. We drove there via some gardens built following the 1973 eruptions. In 1973, lava flow from nearby Eldfell destroyed half the town and threatened to close its harbour its main income source. An operation to cool the advancing lava with seawater saved the harbor. At 1 a.m. on the 23rd of January, 1973, a volcanic eruption of the mountain Eltfell began on Hainai. A concentrated lava flow headed toward the harbor. The winds changed, and half a million cubic meters of ash blew on the town. During the night, the 5,000 inhabitants of the island were evacuated, mostly by fishing boats, as almost the entire fishing fleet was in dock. The eruption lasted until 3rd of July. We visited the state church by the harbor. Most eating places seemed closed but we had lunch at Café Maria, which was good with helpful staff. The waiter gave Diana DVD of the islands, mainly marketing information. Couldn't get the ferry back until 5 p.m. ish, so we spent some of the afternoon in the aquarium and museum of natural history.
Later we drove around the island. This is the high point of the island. After the ferry crossing back to the mainland we stopped to see Sal Jalans first. John got out to walk around the back of the waterfall but Jason and Diane stayed in the car to avoid the heavy rain. Diane and Jason had an evening meal at the hotel. John wasn't too well after the boat trip. Wednesday the 1st of June. We left Hotel Hofdabrak at a drive to Reykjavik. We stopped for lunch at Havarajadil, 45 kilometers from Reykjavik, and had a very nice lunch, including earth-cooked bread, at a cafe, called Jot and Kunst. Throughout the year, pillars of steam from the many hot springs in the town may be seen rising up out of the ground. We then visited the town's fenced-off geothermal area which has numerous hot springs and fumaroles. In a hole in the park, the locals bake the famous black bread using the geothermal ground as an oven. The restaurant Jot and Kunst is only 50 meters from the geothermal park. The town is known for its greenhouses, which are heated by hot water from volcanic hot springs. The existence of hot springs led people to settle in Hvarajadin. The natural hot water could be used for space heating, for cooking, baking and laundry. These springs are the sites of certain extremophile microorganisms that are capable of surviving in extremely hot environments. After stopping at Helisheva Geothermal Power Station for an educational tour, we drove on to Reykjavik to a hotel plaza. The hotel was okay, but no bath mats. Jason's room overlooked the hotel service area well. We went for an evening meal at the restaurant Hofnin by the harbour. Thursday the 2nd of June. We set off on the Golden Circle tour on a self-drive. The first stop was Thingvella where we visited the exhibition center then took some photos. Jason and John went for a stroll to see parts of the North Atlantic Ridge. Thingvella is where one can see dramatically how the continents of America and Eurasia are pulling apart from each other on the North Atlantic Ridge.
We continued on our tour to visit Jesa and stopped for a very nice lunch at restaurant Lindian Vistra Cafe at Lorga Baton on the way. Pity we didn't have time for a full meal. The Great Jesa is a geyser in the southwestern part of the country, east of Reykjavik. It was the first geyser described in a printed source and the first known to modern Europeans. The Jesa site lies in the Hawkadala Valley on the slopes of Lorgaf Jaw Hill, which is also the home to Strugha Geyser about 50 meters south. Spent some time at the site watching eruptions and walking around the area. It was fairly busy with tourists. There are around 30 much smaller geysers and hot pools in the area, including one called Little Jaser, Little Jaser. The nearby geyser struck her erupts much more frequently than Jaser erupting to heights of up to 30 meters every few minutes. We had to wait around for the periodic eruptions with the cameras at the ready and hoping not to miss them. Stroke her, Icelandic fall, churn is a fountain geyser in the same geothermal area beside the Havita River. Strucker's activity has also been affected by earthquakes, although to a lesser extent than the Great Jaser. Strokar is one of Iceland's most famous geysers, erupting about every 8 to 10 minutes, 15 to 20 meters high, sometimes up to 40 meters high. Strokar and its surrounding areas regularly attracts tourists to view the Giza, as it is one of very few natural geysers to erupt frequently and reliably. Eruptions of the Great Jaser can hold boiling water up to 70 meters in the air. However, eruptions may be infrequent and have in the past stopped altogether for years at a time. Descriptions of the Great Jaser and Strokar have been given in many travel guides to Iceland published from the 18th century onwards. Together with Thingvella and the Gulfas waterfall, they are part of the Golden Circle that make up the most famous tourist route in the country. When we arrived at Gulfas, we walked to both viewing points. There is an upper and a lower viewing area. Gulfas is a waterfall located in the canyon of the Havita River in southwest Iceland. The river flows down into a wide curved three step staircase then abruptly plunges in two stages into a crevice 32 meters deep. John and eventually Jason walk down this footpath to get a closer look.
The spray from the waterfall produced a fine wetness but also gave us a wonderful rainbow. The average amount of water running over this waterfall is 140 cubic meters per second in the summertime and 80 cubic meters per second in the winter time. The highest flood measured was 2,000 cubic meters per second. As one first approaches the falls, the crevice is obscured from view, so that it appears that a mighty river simply vanishes into the earth. We drove back to Reykjavik and visited Skalholt Church with its wonderful interior and stained glass windows. On the way back to the hotel we also stopped at Currith Crater. Currith, occasionally anglicized as Currith or Currid, is a volcanic crater lake located in the Greensons area in South Iceland, on the Golden Circle tourist route. The caldera itself is approximately 55 meters deep, 170 meters wide, and 270 meters across. It is one of several crater lakes in the area, known as Iceland's Western Volcanic Zone created as the land moved over a localized hotspot, but it is the one that has the most visually recognizable caldera still intact. The caldera, like the other volcanic rock in the area, is composed of a red, rather than black, volcanic rock. We had an evening meal at a Viking restaurant, called the King Akrain. It was a bit touristy but quite good. Friday the 3rd of June. We paid a morning visit to Halgrimskukja, the parish church of Reykjavik. The church is also used as an observation tower. An observer can take a lift up to the viewing deck and view Reykjavik and the surrounding mountains. Halgrimskukja, church of Halgrimur, is a Lutheran church of Iceland, at 73 meters, it is the largest church in Iceland and the sixth tallest architectural structure in Iceland. The church is named after the Icelandic poet and clergyman Halgrimur Pétursson, 1614 to 1674, author of the Passion Hymns. State architect Guthjan Samuelson's design of the church was commissioned in 1937. He is said to have designed it to resemble the basalt lava flows of Iceland's landscape. It took 38 years to build the church. Construction work began in 1945 and ended in 1986, the landmark tower being completed long before the church's actual completion. The crypt beneath the choir was consecrated in 1948. The steeple and wings were completed in 1974, and the nave was consecrated in 1986. Situated in the center of Reykjavik, it is one of the city's best-known landmarks and is visible throughout the city. We then drove by the lake and took some photos. Jason went back to the hotel and Diane and John explored a bit more of Reykjavik. Old houses. Parliament building. Falcon House etc. We had lunch all together at a cafe then Diane and Jason went for a whale watching trip. The sea was very rough so the trip was aborted part the way through and we returned.
stopping by a puffin island for distant photos. John went to the National Museum, back to the hotel for a rest and then we went for a final evening meal where John and Diane ate Icelandic specialities, including puffin, whale and goose. Saturday the 4th of June. We set off early for the drive to Keflavik and to return the hire car. We were very grateful to a woman called Brynhilda Sverisdotter who is a contact from All Iceland Limited for keeping us informed. Brynray arranged everything by one day, following the delay caused by the volcano, so we didn't miss out anything on our trip. It was also reassuring to be able to phone to check on changed flight times and to get information about the volcano Ajaf Jalajokal Visitor Center. The plane was on time but again had no duty-free supplies as apparently the company was in the process of changing suppliers. Arrived back at Gatwick early afternoon to lovely sunny weather and we drove back to Orpington. Jason was able to use his pre-book ticket and return to pull by train in the evening. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the film. Goodbye.